Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here on EWTN. And once again, we have this great privilege to come together to reflect and to share the story of the good things that God has done in our lives. And tonight we're joined by Father Corwin Lowe, OP. Uh, he's a former nominal Christian. He was in the tech world, a lot of interesting stuff in his story. He's now a Dominican friar of the province of the most holy name of Jesus. Father, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you for your vocation, your witness, uh, being here in your habits and coming to, <laughs> to share your story with us. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'll step out of the way. Let's go back to the beginning. Where does your spiritual journey begin? It's interesting because I believe that uh, the Holy Spirit had a hand in things very early on. Yeah. But of course, I didn't recognize too much of it mm -hmm. until later. But um, it really started uh, in my family. Uh, I'm Chinese American. Mm -hmm. I was born in Seattle. Okay. I have two brothers and a sister. And my parents are really first generation Chinese. Okay. And so they have a lot of strong um, traditional values. One of those values was we need to have good education. Mm -hmm. So we moved to an area, a suburb of Seattle called Mercer Island, and that their sole reason was because it had the best school district in the entire state. And they, right now it's kind of a upper middle class place and a little bit uppity up, but at the time in 1968 it was just another little suburb. Mm -hmm. But we were, all four of us children, were pretty much tasked to going on to university. That's what we were, you know, chartered to do. But we also had a very strong Christian upbringing. We okay. went to the local Presbyterian church. And we were Presbyterian, but not really because there was any sort of doctrinal adherence or anything like that. It's just because yeah. they favored uh, the messages that the pastor gave on a weekly basis. But we were expected to go to church every Sunday and go to Sunday school in addition to their services. Did your parents grow Christian? My mom did. Okay. My dad uh, had to be sort of brought along by my mom once they got married. Yeah. But that was, it was something that he accepted gotcha. pretty easily. Throughout the week, of course, in most Protestant churches, there's not very much, but we went to after-school Bible camp mm -hmm. on, I think it was Mondays or Tuesdays, but uh, uh, those afternoons were devoted to, you know, typical Protestant things like memorizing verses, a mm -hmm. little bit of Bible study, and, and, and that sort of thing. Because my parents were very interested in us children having a good ethical and moral background. And uh, for that, I really, really thank them and appreciate uh, the efforts that they put into it because it, it did require a lot of effort on their part. Mm -hmm. You know, they were also um, strong believers, mm -hmm. but they really wanted these values to be instilled into us. And as a minority in Seattle, you know, being Chinese, um, they wanted us to um, succeed and often for minorities, that means you know, working twice as hard to get half as far as that, mm -hmm. what my dad and mom used to say all the time. <laughs> so we had to do things like sports, Boy Scouts, any sort of extracurricular activities because they, all of them helped form us in a certain way. Gotcha. And um, so when we <clears throat> got to the time where we were going to university, mm -hmm. I chose to go to the University of Washington. My dad was the first uh, um, child in his family mm -hmm. to go to college and to get a degree. And so we were supposed to follow in his footsteps. And he, get, he gets a degree in aeronautics and astronautics, so the bar <laughs> was pretty high. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I like to say this it's sort of tongue in cheek. My parents said that we could go to um, college and study anything we want as long as it was engineering or medicine. Because they knew that if we got those types of degrees that we would be okay as far as getting a job and providing for families and, and whatnot. Right. So that, 
that was kind of our goal. I chose to go into electrical engineering, and um, part of the way through it, I <clears throat> sort of discerned computer science because I was very proficient in computers and you know all things computers. <laughs> Looking back, I think I was a little bit of a gearhead yeah. uh, nerd. So now uh, up into university, and, and as you enter into it. Had, and had, had your faith followed you at all? Had it really taken root at all? It did. Um, I went to the Presbyterian Church on camp, or next to campus, which is a very big uh, um, Presbyterian Church, and had prominent uh, preachers there. But when I was studying, I was also working, and I kind of liked the money that came with the working part, and so I was working a lot. Mm -hmm. And so typically in college, you, you work on the weekends, right? And not so much on, on the weekdays. And so I would work on Sundays, mm -hmm. and it didn't really seem to be an, a decision to make a church or make money. So um, that's what I ended up doing is okay. working. Okay. Um, I knew I wanted to be a software developer, and so that's kind of what where I was heading. And uh, one of the first jobs that I got was working for Paul Allen. And I don't know if you know who he is or who he was, because he's passed on. Okay. But he founded Microsoft with Bill Gates. Oh, okay. And so he and Bill Gates are kind of very famous in the tech world, because mm. they're very early on. Um, but he developed cancer uh, part of the way through working for Microsoft, so he had to step back. Of course, he still had all of his shares in Microsoft, so he did. He came out very well, <laughs> successful. Um, he was treated, and uh, the cancer went into remission, and he had no real desire to go back to Microsoft, but he wanted to start a new effort, a new software um, company, and I went to work for that company, wow. and so that was a really a privilege, but I was kind of dumped into this environment that most people really only dream of. Uh, at the time, I like to say he was uh, worth about $640 million, <laughs> and um, in my eyes were like, that is a colossal amount of money. And of course, this was before anybody was really a billionaire, um, or about the time that people started popping up as billionaires. And I remember him telling me that he, there, no matter what he did, no matter how much he spent the money, he couldn't. Uh, it kept growing. And so, you know, for a young software developer, that sort of it's like that's what I want, and that's kind of where I was going. Um, while I was working for uh, his company, I started to question um, my career choice because as a software developer, you go into a dark room and you code and you code and you code and you come out maybe once or twice a week, maybe three times a week <laughs> if you're lucky. And that's when you interact with people. You, talk, you have meetings, you have um, bug reports, um, you work on features, um, you know, overall direction of where how things are going. And then you go back into this dark room and you do that again. And I thought, this is not really the life for me. I need to have more interaction with actual people. And uh, so I sort of hemmed and hawed about it, but I ended up sort of deciding to leave. However, that company made a, a really big impression on me. And, and Paul Allen, you know, he, at that time he had purchased the Portland Trailblazers, the basketball team. And if we were especially good, we got invited to go to Portland to watch a home game. Well, I was in Seattle, so we had to, had to, you know, get on his uh, private 757, fly to Portland, watch a game. If we won, we got to go to Powell's Bookstore, which is a huge uh, bookstore. It takes up, at that time, it took up two city blocks. And then we would fly back to Seattle, and that was just something that normal people did not do. Yeah. <laughs> and so I kind of weighed, you know, I can't be a software developer against, you know, having that, those sorts of opportunities, but I really needed to do something else. So 
I decided to turn myself into a consultant, and I was very uh, uh, good at computer networking. And computer networking at this time was in its infant stages. Mm -hmm. And since I kind of migrated to it and I was very good at it, I decided to become a network consultant. And my first customer was Paul Allen. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so I, even though I kind of stepped away from his software development company, yeah. I ended up going back as kind of a, a network a software or a computer network design engineer. And it, it was great. The opportunity was, you know, this doesn't happen to very many people. Um, but he had properties all over the world, really. He had London and, and New York and Los Angeles, Hawaii, and also Seattle. And um, I got to internet work his computers. And at the time, he was very interested in entertainment. So we were doing control systems for... Um, controlling audio and video entertainment. So I got to do all of these really fun things. Also at the time he had all these yachts that he was, well one he had bought and one he was developing and a third one came later, but it was, it was, you know, the last one had a helicopter pad and a submarine. <laughs> so these things were just completely out of touch of what I would consider real people, but I was right in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, interconnecting the properties, his uh, yachts, his airplanes. So it was, it was like, you know, pinch me, wake me up in the morning. Is, is this really real? Um, and it was the opportunities I had to travel and to go to uh, fantastic places and work on cool cutting edge technology is, is like hardly anybody had that access. Yeah. So, um, but then I realized, you know, working for a wealthy man is different than being a wealthy man. And you could work a lot for a wealthy man, but that doesn't help your career that much. You get to do all these um, interesting and fun things on somebody else's control, but not really on your own control. So um, I thought about uh, starting my own company. And um, actually, the IT director of his software company, he and I formed an, another company to do uh, network infrastructure design, which, you know, the internet was in its infancy, really, really infancy at the time. And the first thing that we were charged to do, we were asked to do by a publisher, was to write a book about the internet. <laughs> and you know, you think right now nobody writes a book about the internet because what would you say? Right. And it's like, well, <laughs> go on the internet and figure it out. Well, yeah. that's what we're trying to do. But in 1994, it was unheard of and actually very difficult to do because none of the computer systems, even including Microsoft Windows, had no ability to naturally uh, connect to the internet. So we kind of wrote this do it yourself, how to get on the internet, and it managed to sell, it and all of its editions sold 750,000 copies. So it was very good timing. Yeah. Meanwhile, you know, as far as my faith goes, mm -hmm. it was pretty much non-existent. I really, I really kind of took that line, well, I'm spiritual but not religious. You know, that was my excuse for not going to church right. on Sundays. Um, and I was so, uh, mired in my work uh, that uh, just didn't have time for it, and it didn't really bother me. Yeah. Um, so we used, my business partner and I used the royalties, the funds that came from the royalties, to really kind of start a, a legitimate company. And uh, we didn't, we departed from network infrastructure design because we recognized really early on that it would be commoditized and it would be owned by the utilities, which right now it's owned by all the utilities. Uh, so we um, landed on a topic that uh, we called computer network security, but today people call it cybersecurity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's sort of a trashy name, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, we knew that security would never go away as a problem and it would never be commoditized. And as long as we were able to be nimble, we could 
you know, advance and, and always do well. And one of our first um, customers was Microsoft. Mm. And at the time, Microsoft, the internet was around, but Microsoft was not attached to the internet. And so we were tasked to put Microsoft corporate onto the internet and do so in a very intentional way uh, to be secure and to make sure that uh, corporate intellectual property was secure as well as to sort of monitor activity from the in inside going to the outside because one of the major concerns about at the time uh, for companies was employee productivity you know if you hire somebody and they're spending seven hours a day you know surfing the web they're not getting a lot of their money's worth so you know getting that caliber of a client very early on right. sort of propelled us into getting other uh, fortune 500 companies and so we got like the military boeing a lot of biotech firms um universities uh, banks, hospitals, law firms. I mean, we were doing very, very well. Mm -hmm. And so much to the point that I could really do whatever I wanted. I could buy whatever I wanted, go wherever I wanted, when I ever I wanted, you know, for stay at nice places, eat at fine restaurants. And it was, I really thought, wow, I've really made it. But then <laughs> the big question came up, well, what do you do now? Yeah. If you have everything you need or want, what's next? And so that really kind of embedded a big question mark in in my mind. And I was like, well, and the answer I got back from other people was, well, I'll continue to do more. Why? <laughs> I don't want to knock myself out just to make you know, more money or have more things. It's, it's not like I had an extravagant amount of things like the rich and famous have these days, but yeah. I didn't really want that anyways. I'm kind of the shy kind. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to be, you know, uh, on magazines or anything like that, or in the newspaper. I say that as I'm being interviewed, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, really, I just the the question was: Is this it? Right. Is this what I'm supposed to do? Is this is this supposed to be fulfilling for me? And it wasn't. So um, that created a, a, a conundrum for me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In 1994, um, I met with my uh, intellectual property attorney to work on this Microsoft um, contract. I actually worked with him for a couple of years, um, but I never met him in person. <laughs> is uh, we did everything by telephone and email, and yeah. that was sufficient. We just didn't need to do very much. And then, believe it or not, we had to use couriers uh, <laughs> to, to pass um, documents Different around. world. Yeah, been, really different yeah. world. Wow. Um, but I remember meeting him face to face the first time in 1994. I walked into his office, and off to the side, uh, he had a bookshelf and uh, a crucifix and some icons. And I had a really good education, and so I already knew what they were. And so I said, kind of like a leading question, what's this? You know, I fully expected him to say, well, this is a crucifix, and this is, you know, an icon, and this is an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary, or whatever. But what he responded with was, it's my daily reminder of who's in charge. Uh. And... This is coming from an attorney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, most people already have suspicious, you know, suspicions about, or they're skeptical about attorneys and what right. motivates them. But that, that kind of struck me as, wow, this person has some, some integrity, um, and especially as an attorney. So over the years, he and I got to be quite good friends and I met his family very early on. Uh, it turns out he homeschooled his kids, was very concerned with his children's upbringing and formation. And, you know, when I went over to his house, it was very clear what his priorities were. Mm -hmm. And his work was just something he did to make his family 
happen. And that was like, what is this? <laughs> it, was, it was revelatory. Mm -hmm. And it, it, what, you know, materially, his most important thing was providing for his family and forming, formating his kids. So that really took me by surprise. And um, I really have him to thank for kind of creating that little spark in me. Yeah. Um, that was about 1994, 1995. So in 1999, I'd, um, after I had done very, very well and it was very successful, I decided kind of as a thank you to take him and his two oldest boys and his father-in-law to Rome. Um, and I was going to show them around because I'd been there before mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, they're very faithful Catholics and what Catholic would not want to go to Rome. Right. And so we went and within a very short period, I realized that I was a tourist and they were pilgrims. Hmm. And they were the joy that they had of just being in these places with the, where the saints walked, where uh, the church, the heart of the church, as far as decision making and the magisterium of the church was right there. They were so joyful to be there. And I realized, what is this joy that you have? Yeah. Because it's not, I mean, I have everything I want or need, but I wasn't getting that part. And so that's kind of when, you know, I, another revelation happened and I decided that I needed to make some sort of change. What that was, I didn't know what it was. Right. Um, in November, I went back to Rome. And <laughs> every November, about Thanksgiving, I go to a different country and I write my Christmas cards. So um, <laughs> I, I still have this sort of Christian, you know, desire to communicate with people at least once a year. Yeah. And I went to a different country every time. And this time I decided to go to Rome. And that was sort of my secondary purpose. My, fir my primary purpose was like, what is it about Rome that would excite a Catholic? And so I called up my friend, and I, my attorney, who is my friend, and I said, what should I do? And I was like a little bit embarrassed to ask him that question. He goes, oh, you should go to Mass. And so... Had you ever been to Mass before? I, I had, but I, it was not really sure. because I was interested in what it right. was. It was because somebody asked me and, you know, I wanted to respect them. Sure. And I had been to Mass uh, in high school. Um, but since then, hardly any at all. Sure. So um, he said, you should go to one of the basilicas. And I said, well, okay, I'll go to Santa Maria Maggiore, St. Mary Major. And <laughs> this is hilarious. I walked in there, and because it's a major kind of tourist opportunity, you know, doing daily mass there is a challenge. Yeah. And they have to have a security guard kind of keeping the faithful in and the, you know, photo taking tourists sort of out. And I remember thinking, this guy knows who I am. I'm, I'm a <laughs> fraud. <laughs> and so I, I, I was trying to get in, but I didn't want him to like single me out and say, no, no, this is only for those who want to pray. Chris, none of that was going through his mind, but that was going through my mind. Yeah. So I sort of slipped in, and I had this ordo in English and Italian so I could sort of understand what was going on, but I was so uptight that it was kind of a miserable experience. <laughs> so I called up um, my friend and I said, hey, this didn't really go over very well. And he goes, well, don't give up. Why don't you go to a smaller church? And I was staying in a hotel on the Aventine Hill. It's one of the seven hills of Rome, mm -hmm. and it's also the quietest. And there are a lot of religious houses on the Aventine. So the next morning I got up pretty early and I walked over to the church of Santa Sabina. And it was about 6.30, 6, 6.30. Um, so it was still kind of dark, it was November. And I thought, I wonder if they're open. 
And so I push on the door, and of course it opens, and uh, it was very dark inside. And I thought, even though I'm in computer network security, this seems like really unwise. <laughs> so I walk in, and I'd been to Santa Sabina before, but really purely from a, this is an architectural sort of thing, but never as this is a place where you actually worship. <clears throat> and I thought I was alone because it was empty. Um, but there was a side chapel um, off to the left that I didn't notice Im in initially. So I walked in there and or towards it, and there were about four friars who were, you know, they were adoring the Blessed Sacrament, which was exposed. Of course, I didn't know any of this. I was just thought this is really medieval because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it looks straight out of some sort of. Uh, movie. Yeah. And I thought, well, I guess I'm not alone, um, but I really did want to go to Mass there, and it started at 7.15. And so Santa Zabini is a little unusual in that it has a, a choir in the center, and so the choir stalls and they face each other, and, um, and you have to walk into the choir uh, to get in, into there and participate. So I walked in. And the lights are still out. And about 7.05, I hear this click. And the uh, lights, you'd think, would come on, but they were those gas neon lights. Yeah. And so they don't turn on immediately. They just get brighter and brighter and brighter. And they got very bright. And I realized it felt like a spotlight was on me. <laughs> it wasn't really, but it just yeah. it felt like it. And I was like, oh, if anybody comes out, they're going to notice I'm here. About 10 after, and uh, the door to the sacristy opens, and literally what I describe as an army of Dominicans, they were all wearing white, um, they file out of the sacristy and, sacristy and start filing into the choir stalls, and I'm thinking, oh, should I even be here? <laughs> and fortunately, they didn't reach the section that I was in. And but the first thing that came to my mind was, run right now. <laughs> you can get away from this situation. But I thought, you know, I think I even stood up, and I. Uh, but I thought, well, this is why I am here, and so I sat back down. And and the Dominicans for uh, mass, they combine it with morning prayer. But of course, I didn't know this, and that doesn't match with my ordo because they start with the psalms and they start chanting them side to side. But even though that I didn't know what was going on, I thought that it was really beautiful. Not in any sort of aesthetic sense, because Dominicans can't normally sing <laughs> or chant. It, and plus this house, and I, I was to find out later, was a very international house, so not everybody speaks Italian. And so it was kind of stilted. And But it, there was a joy to their chanting that really struck me. So after Mass, I got up to leave, and I exited the choir, and a friar comes around the choir, and he approaches me and asks me if I was Korean. He asked me in Italian, and I responded, no, I'm an American. And his answer was, really? I'm from Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Really? What are you doing here? And he explained, you know, he, he, we're Dominican friars and we do this every day and, um, you know, come back if you want. So I came back the next day yeah. and he came around again and said, oh, you came back. And I said, well, you kind of asked me to. <laughs> and he, he gave me a mini tour of the church. And this church was built in 432. Oh. And that just floored me. I'm like, my churches are all, you know, I grew up or built in the 60s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Barely 40 years old, uh, you know, 30. Uh, and this thing was 1,600 years old. Yeah. And so he um, gave me a little bit of tour, uh, a tour of what the symbols meant and the, uh, the windows. And I was very fascinated, but he asked me, 
so what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm kind of exploring. Um, and he goes, well, you're on vacation. I said, mm, not really. I'm just trying to see what's what. And I was being very vague because I didn't really want to commit to any anything, especially with a stranger. And, I, and he asked me, well, what do I do? And I said, <laughs> whenever anybody asks me what do I do, I always kind of come up with this, uh, how do I explain security and computer networks to people that don't really know? Right. So I usually, the response, stock response is, well, I'm in computers. Yeah. To which he responded, really? I have a problem with my computer. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> and so I, you know, something in me said, why don't you just help him? And I, and I said, well, I can probably help you with that. And he goes, uh, no, you're on vacation. I'll, I'll just deal with the problem. Yeah. And so I said, no, really, I can help you. And he, he goes, OK. So um, he invites me in yeah. to breakfast. And we um, make plans for me to come back later and um, help him with his computer. Let's take a break there, Father. Okay. We'll do a br brief break uh, at that, this, <laughs> this, this providential meeting that you have in this medieval thousand plus year old <laughs> church and see what happens after okay. that. So we'll be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of Father Corwin's story. See you then. Well, hello and welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight, speaking with Father Corwin Lowe, OP. Uh, he's a former nominal Christian, a big, big shot in the tech world. We've heard a little bit of that background. And when we left off his story, uh, he had just met up with uh, some Dominicans there in, uh, what was the name of the church again, Father? Santa Sabina. Yeah, I don't want to get the pronunciation wrong there. This chance meeting, this providential meeting, uh, I got a friar who's got having trouble with his computer. <laughs> so yes. we'll pick it up from there, Father. What happened next? So um, actually returned later in the day, uh, in, later in the morning, uh, for to, to help uh, Father with his computer. And uh, I looked at it and I go, oh, this doesn't look very good. Uh, essentially what had happened is uh, he had lost his address book. It had become corrupted. Um, and he had lost access to it. And this is the headquarters of the Dominicans worldwide. And so he needs to be able to communicate with people all over the world, especially at the time email. Mm -hmm. And he had no way of everything was there. And uh, I told him after kind of looking around and doing some forensics, I said, well, it's corrupted. However, and you're, you're not gonna be able to get it all back. However, if you happen to know the name of a person that you want to contact, I can make a little script that you can just type in their name and it will give you their information. So it's not everything, it's just on demand as you, you know, want to look things up. And he goes, well, that's great. That's better than I have now. Yeah. And so I spent a little time writing this script that allowed him to do that and eventually was able to, you know, over time, recreate everything that he needed. But by this time it was like 12, 1230 and he says, hey, do you want to stick around for lunch? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> 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 Who gets invited to go to lunch in some monastery yeah. in the middle of Rome? And so uh, he called up the kitchen and said, we have an extra guest. And so I went upstairs. And it, that's when I saw the real international nature of the Dominican order, because they had tables uh, separated by language groups. So we had English and Spanish and French, German. Um, and so obviously, I got put at the English table. And I met uh, a couple of Dominicans around the world, particularly in Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, we had, I was actually kind of stunned that I was even there. The master of the order was there, and of course, he'd, I didn't know him from Adam. <laughs> yeah. um, but it struck me as, how did this really happen? So that time that I was in Rome, many other things happened, but I'm just sort of giving you the highlight yeah. of it. So I came back to Seattle and um, 
the father that I helped with his computer gave me a couple of names of people, of Dominicans that were living in Seattle and ministering in Seattle. So I did what I would normally do. I emailed them mm -hmm. and one responded and uh, he, I, he talked to me a, a couple of times for hours and I thought, who does this? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, <clears throat> January rolls around, and my friend who had a flat or an apartment on the Aventine Hill in Rome, he emailed me and said, hey, I'm coming back. And I said, I thought you were going to be on sabbatical for a year, and it hasn't been a year. And he said, well, I'm a little bit homesick. So I said, what are you doing with your apartment? And he said, well, I'm giving it up. And I just sort of threw this out there as a joke. And I said, well, can I have it? And he didn't respond. And after about a week, I did get a response. And he said, it's all been arranged. It's yours. I didn't realize this. <laughs> he was trying to get out of his lease. <laughs> and because I had said that, he, was, he thought, oh, well, I'll take over the lease. And then he wasn't on the hook. Gotcha. And so that's why he went through that. Um, that process and then I was like maybe I do want it and so um, I thought about it and I was like I have all these clients and I have all this work that I need to do and how could I possibly go on what was slated to be like a three-month sabbatical so I talked to my business partner and I said do you think it would be okay if I went on a three-month sabbatical? And he said, I think that would be a really good thing and healthy thing for you to do. And I th that was kind of like permission to go, but I had all these clients. But over a period of a couple of days, not weeks, but days, they all sort of came to this point where I really could go to Rome. So I kind of packed my bags uh, and I went to Rome and um, I got this apartment. It was very small, but everything's very small in Rome yeah. as far as apartment living goes. So the first thing I did is I went up to Santa Sabina. I knew that the father that met me before, he, he was a socius of Latin America, so he was on the road. But I went um, to morning prayer and mass, and a couple of people at the English speaking table recognized me, you know, from being there a couple of months earlier. And they, after mass, they came back and said, Hey, you came back. You want to come in for breakfast? I'm like, okay. So, you know, I kind of reestablished a link with that, uh, priory. And one of, uh, the friars was an American th that, uh, worked for Southern Bell. <laughs> in Georgia and telecommunications was very close to computer networking at that time. So he and I <laughs> got a lot to talk about. Yeah. And I thought, these people are normal. And of course, it's <laughs> they're religious. So I was speaking from a, a slightly uh, skewed place. But I, I just thought they were, these religious people were weird. Um, they were very hyper-religious and they did their own thing, but they weren't, they didn't have any touch with reality. And um, so, but I was determined to go to morning prayer and mass there because I loved the chanting and the communal prayer. I also went down the street uh, to Sant Anselmo, which is a Benedictine monastery, and they had Vespers. So I would go to the Dominicans for um, morning prayer and the Benedictines for evening prayer. And so I sort of, without even knowing it, I was starting to anchor my day around these prayer times. Right. And uh, I, I didn't know what was really happening to me, but I was participating in the prayer of the church uh, every day. And so, but I did it because I loved it. And it wasn't because, you know, somebody said, oh, you should go to prayer. Um, yeah. And so from that angle, it was, I have a very different, you know, conversion. Mm -hmm. But three months turned into 13 months. Wow. So I was there for a very long time. And I, I had only been at Santa Sabina maybe two weeks. 
and um, a friar came up to me from Latin America and he asked me if I was going to see the Holy Father. And I said, no. <laughs> he goes, well, on Ash Wednesday every year, the Holy Father comes here and imposes ashes onto the faithful. Um, and then he asked me if I was going to go. And I said, well, papal events sort of require tickets to which he reached under his habit and handed me a ticket. And I thought, wow, how does this happen? I mean, I've only been there a couple of weeks. I mean, he saw him every day, but he actually recognized that this was, might be something that I'd want to go to. Mm -hmm. And so he said, come back at the appropriate time and sit right here. And he pointed to one of the choir stalls. And um, I said, okay. So I went, and this was during John Paul II's time. Right. So he comes in, celebrates Mass, um, imposes uh, ashes on, it, on everybody. And then during the recession, uh, he comes by and he looks right at me and I look at him. And I had always assumed that the Pope was a, pol a political figure, a world leader, which of course he is, mm -hmm. but it didn't occur to me that he was really the spiritual father to all the Catholics in the world. But he communicated this to me in a glance. And, the, and suddenly it was like, wow, this is a grace that, I didn't even know what what grace was yeah, <laughs> at the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. that not everybody gets, a revelation that not everybody gets. And so that was really kind of a, a it wasn't really a turning point, but it was another milestone mm -hmm. uh, in my journey. So after a few weeks of living in Rome, uh, I got to know the Dominicans very well because I was fixing problems. But then they passed me off to the Benedictines and some Franciscans, and so I was getting like known as the guy that can fix your computer problems. <laughs> I, I, and I was happy to do it because, you know, when you solve someone's problem and you can see them light up and like now I can get work done or this has been hindering me for so long. And I'm naturally a problem solver anyways, so this was very delightful for me. But <clears throat> a Dominican um, was posted as the director for the patrons of the arts at the Vatican Museums. And he knew I was in town, and he asked me if I could help him with the website for the patrons of the arts. And I said, sure. And of course, that was in Vatican City, so I had to go through the bronze doors and, and you know, go to their office, which is right below the papal apartments. And, and I'm thinking, wow, this is a world I had never even knew existed as a reality, right? Yeah. So, you know, you hear about it, uh, you read about it, but you, didn't, you don't think you're ever right. going to be in that situation. And so they really just wanted to produce a website for the patrons. And um, as part of that, I was able to go to the Vatican Museums and be in the Sistine Chapel by myself. I mean, not really by myself, but with a security guard. Yeah. But, but not very many people have been in the Sistine mm -hmm. Chapel by themselves yeah. um, and other places throughout the museums. And um, I did have a great appreciation from art um, in, in my studies in high school, of all places. And uh, one day while I was at the Patrons of the Arts, uh, the director there, the Dominican, got a call from the Vatican Internet Office. And they were looking for someone to help them with media, multimedia, on their website that coincided with World Youth Day. This is the Jubilee year of 2000. Mm -hmm. And they asked, me, asked uh, the director of the patrons, did they know anybody? I'm like, well, he's standing right here. <laughs> so he sent me over to the, uh, the Vatican Internet office. The director was on the telephone. And so, you know, I wanted to be polite and not feel like I was, you know, eavesdropping or anything like that. So I started to walk around the room and 
uh, they had a bookshelf, and on the bookshelf was a copy of the book I'd written. Oh, wow. So I pulled it out <laughs> and I said, hey, this is me, <laughs> which of course, if you write a book about anything, it presumes you have some sort of credibility and knowledge, right? So that was that, and I was able to, you know, help them through uh, streaming video uh, and uh, amongst other things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was going to the Vatican Internet Office, not every day, but pretty close to every day for wow. a good long time, almost six months. And uh, on this extended sabbatical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so the cat w was let out of the bag when I was at uh, in the in Vatican Internet Office, and there was a CD-ROM. Mm -hmm. And I don't. Many people don't even know what a CD-ROM is these <laughs> days. Tuesday. But uh, the title of the CD-ROM was the encyclicals of Pope John Paul II. So I turned to the director and I said, what's an encyclical? And the expression on the face was like, and then the question came out, are you Catholic? <laughs> and then I thought, oh my gosh, I've been, I've been revealed. Yeah. <laughs> and so I said, no. <laughs> And then, and then I thought, what is keeping me from being Catholic? And, um, you know, I didn't make a decision right there, but it, it, it kind of revealed like I was just sort of treading mm -hmm. at that point. And, it, and other people had said, well, what are you doing with this Catholic thing? And including people that said, you know, all your friends are like religious or priests. And I'm like, really? No, that's not right. And then it was like, oh, it is right. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to, you know, in Italy, everybody's born into the Catholic faith mm -hmm. because of family lineage. So there is no such thing as RCIA. And uh, um, so I went, uh, I was referred to, to a couple of American priests that could help me. And they agreed to, uh, on Easter Sunday of 2001 to uh, receive me into the Catholic Church. And it was weird because, because I had done so much work just with all these religious mm -hmm. orders and also uh, in the Vatican, unbeknownst to me, they were going to have the Holy Father mm -hmm. um, baptize me on the Easter Vigil on 2001. But because I was raised as Presbyterian and I'd already been baptized, you can't be baptized twice. Right. And so that wasn't going to work out because they just don't do two rites mm -hmm. um, like they do in many parishes. Right. And so they, they kind of came back disappointed. Um, and I was not that disappointed. I mean, of course, initially it was like, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when you do anything in a papal mass, they give you two tickets. Mm -hmm. But how do you, we, with all these friends and family that w would be interested in me, in witnessing um, my uh, uh, confirmation, yeah. you know, how do you choose? Yeah. So uh, the Dominicans came to the rescue and they said, you could be um, confirmed at Santa Sabina on Easter Sunday. And so that's what happened. A week before yeah. I broke the news to my parents mm -hmm. and I said, uh, I'm going to be confirmed in the Catholic Church in Rome. And they, they knew what confirmation meant. Okay. Uh, but they had asked the question, well, can we come? And in their minds, Catholicism was just another denomination. So mm -hmm. they were not you know, upset or anything like that. In fact, yeah. they were very supportive because it meant I'd have faith in my life. Right. So with a week's notice, they, uh, they all came to Rome wow. and um, they witnessed um, my confirmation. And so that was that. <laughs> oh, fascinating uh, journey, Father. Uh, we, we have about five minutes left. Oh. And so, well, I, so I, it's just amazing again, this, this, how the sabbatical turned into this journey and these connections. So, so with, with that remaining time, tell us what happened after you became Catholic and, then, and how you ended up here. Like this? Dressed like that. <laughs> okay. Well, so that was year 2000. Sure. Or 2001 is when I was confirmed. I came back and I was um, 
a changed man, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And while I was still interested in my company and interested in my employees and furthering their success, the kind of the life went out of me. Uh, and, you know, I really wanted to um, continue the work, but at the end of the, wor end of the day, it was like, what are you doing this for? So I, I worked for a couple more years doing new ventures, doing some mergers and acquisitions and some technology transfers. And then I thought, I think I really need to leave this line of work. So I talked to my business partner. I said, I think we should sell. And he was about ready as well um, because he wanted to go back to teaching. And so that was fine. Mm -hmm. So we decided to sell the company and we sold the company. And in 2005, I took a year off and I decided to discern whether I should become a Dominican. That was, you know, between 2001 and 2005, I tried to make my business kind of work for me. Mm -hmm. And while I was doing very well financially, it was like, I was really not made for that. Mm -hmm. And so um, that year off is when I applied to the Dominicans. And I was trying to downsize my life because I thought at the time that poverty would be the hardest um, vow to make. Mm -hmm. As it turns out it's not the hardest vow to make. <laughs> <laughs> the, the obedience is a much harder yeah. vow. <laughs> and, you know, because I was much older than the average um, incoming Dominican, mm -hmm. I was going to have some challenges ahead of me. So um, when I decided to become a Dominican enter the novitiate in 2006, there was sort of a sadness, um, not in where I was going, but what I was leaving behind. Mm -hmm. um, because in, in, in the tech world, it is sort of intentionally godless because people are afraid to say anything about their faith or live their faith at work or, you know, celebrate mm -hmm. um, what they do. So they kind of leave these compartmentalized lives. They're this way on Sunday and this way during the week. And um, never the two shall meet. And yeah. um, so I went through a standard formation of eight years. I was ordained a priest in 2014. And then I went right into parochial ministry. We actually had two tracks, one as an academic and mm -hmm. one as parochial ministry. And I was there for like eight, eight years, seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And I got a call from my provincial uh, last year. And he said, I think that you should go back into business, not as a businessman, but as an evangelist. Yeah. And so that was my cue to start a new ministry of helping people live their faith, not just privately at work, but also, you know, take a chance and live it fully. Yeah. So there is no contradiction between what I live and what at home and what I live at work. Right. And so that's so yeah. cool to hear, Father. <laughs> well, we, you know, we have just about a minute left here. I mean, I, I think a good way to maybe end this is just take a moment. If there's somebody maybe coming from that world, that tech world, really into business, really, you know, <laughs> successful, you know, uh, in the world, but who has this, as you said in your story, this sense of well, what's next? What's the purpose? Where is this going? What's a, a word of encouragement you might give them for the next step forward? Well, you know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of um, business owners and um, that have to navigate very choppy waters sure. for to um, express their faith. And it's dangerous grounds. I mean, these days you could get fired for being a Catholic or a Christian mm -hmm. or and so people shy away from it. But you know, I just point to my attorney and he did nothing other than just display what is authentically himself, mm -hmm. a, a Catholic believer. And um, if he hadn't done that, I wouldn't have asked the question, what's this? Yeah. And that question is an invitation to start a dialogue. Yeah. And so I wanna be available you know, me and whoever else is working on my ministry to be available to those people that ask those questions mm -hmm. uh, so that they can 
begin their journey in reconciling the two halves of their lives that seem irreconcilable. Very good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Father, for thank your vocation you. and your fidelity to that, <laughs> as well as sharing your story with us today. Thank you very much. And I pray that Father Corwin's story was an inspiration to you. Uh, and again, if you're having those questions, you have the sense of, you know, despite, you know, worldly success and all this, maybe there's something more that God's calling me to in my life. Follow those questions. Seek the answers. Seek prayer. Uh, and seek people who can walk the journey with you. Uh, again, this is the Journey Home Program. We'll be back again next week with another story. Until next time, God bless.